Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel. I'm so delighted you've joined me this evening and I hope you're doing incredibly well and get cosy and comfortable because we've got a lovely story tonight that you're really going to love and it's an incredible encounter that this young girl has with a Bigfoot and this Bigfoot actually teaches her quite a lot of things about what's growing in the forest and where you shouldn't exactly put your hands. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel Click the notification bell and the thumbs up and let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I grew up in New York in a beautiful high-rise apartment in Central Park, overlooking the hustle and bustle of busy city life. You do eventually adapt to the sounds of beeping car horns from yellow cabs, the raised voices of people shouting out in the streets, and the sounds of heavy traffic and squeaking tyres breaking suddenly on the tarmac. It soon just becomes a way of life for you. My strange story starts on Wednesday morning in 1987 in early spring when I tossed my satchel over my shoulder, kissed my parents goodbye on the cheeks and made my way to the local school. Little did I know that my life was going to change so dramatically from this day forward and things would never be the same again, but that is not always a bad thing as you might expect. It was such a beautiful spring day I do remember that very clearly, but for some strange unexplainable reason I had a gut feeling that something was very wrong. It was during my math class that the horrible feeling re-emerged, like that little bird on a cuckoo clock making a sudden reappearance. This ominous, heavy feeling tugged at my heartstrings like a blood-sucking leech that just wouldn't let go. I tried to fight off those terrifying thoughts, but it was to no avail. It was like this twisted uneasiness was relentlessly hammering away at my head, like one of those hellish migraine headaches that refused to shift. What was wrong, I wondered. Why was I experiencing such heightened edginess and deep anxiety? I twisted my dark brown pigtails nervously and stared outside the classroom window. Everything seemed unusually calm, and I surveyed the beautiful manicured greenswood and studied the large majestic oak tree only a few yards from the window. It was swaying in the gentle breeze and the dappled beams of sunlight lit up the emerald green leaves in a shimmering golden green light. Even the blue firmament seemed so calm and serene on this gloriously beautiful spring morning. How could anything go wrong, I wondered. Surely not, I thought. Not on a day as spectacular as this. Katrina, Katrina, I heard the teacher's severe tone reprimanding me. I looked at the teacher, flushing crimson while the students all started to giggle. Drifting off to La La Land and do dozing off in class is not going to help you with your grades. Do you understand, she said. Yes, Miss Markham, I said, shuffling my feet awkwardly under my desk and straightening myself up in my seat, trying to look more alert. My friend Gemma was poking me furiously in the back with her pencil. What's wrong with you today? You look like you're daydreaming. Miss Markham keeps calling your name and you were miles away. What on earth is wrong with you? I'm just a little tired, I said. Suddenly the most extraordinary thing happened. I got a very distinct whiff of my mother's perfume, Chanel No. 5 to be precise, which was incredibly peculiar. I looked around the classroom, but everyone was seated, and no one had just walked past me, but I had definitely smelt her perfume, and even sensed her presence very clearly. Katrina, snapped the teacher, stop dawdling and concentrate. Yes, Miss Markham, I said. Just as Miss Markham was explaining a maths equation on the chalkboard, and her white chalk was squeaking away as she scribbled, I covered my ears because I hated that sound so very much. At that moment an awkward knock could be heard on the classroom door, which Miss Markham hastily opened. Standing in the doorway were two earnest, very official-looking men, attired in very smart black suits, accompanied by our draconian headmistress, whose hair was pinned back very severely in a tight bun, and her deeply entrenched frown wore a cold expression that was devoid of any emotion. All four adults huddled in the doorway, talking attentively together in somewhat raised whispers. "'What's going on?' whispered one of the girls, looking very concerned. For a moment I saw Mrs. Markham's concerned hazel-brown eyes darting very briefly in my direction. I knew at once that they were talking about me. That was clearly obvious. In that moment I could feel nausea welling up in my throat, and my little heart was thumping in my chest like a heavy, heavy drum. Something really terrible must have happened, I thought, and I could feel it in every fibre of my being. But what had happened, I could not and did not want to imagine. Katrina, dear, came Mrs. Markham's voice that had become soft and gentle in its tone. Please gather all your belongings, dear, from your desk, and follow these nice men, will you? The classroom became like a hive of excitable buzzing whispers, 
and I could hear kids saying things like, something terrible must have happened. Poor Catherine. I wonder what's going on. I do hope she's all right. Is everything all right, Miss Markham? I asked her, quivering in terror. Of course it is, dear. No need to worry about a thing. Now I need you to go with these gentlemen, dear, and they will take you to your apartment. To go, so go and get a suitcase of clothes, and then you'll be taken on a three-hour drive to Philadelphia, where you will be staying with your uncle on his farm for a week or so. What happened, Miss Markham? I asked. Are Mum and Dad all right? Everything's absolutely fine, dear. Not to worry about anything. Just go with these nice men, dear, will you? Everything will be explained to you in due course. So there I was in the back of this big black limousine, sitting on the comfortable white leather seats, not having a clue what was going on. You can't imagine how terrifying that was for me. I could hear the men talking in low tones and giving me fleeting, worried glances a few times. For a long time they never said a single word, and neither did I. In truth I was too numb and too scared to ask anything, just in case they told me something that I didn't want to hear. The drive was brief, but if in my mind it was like I, my mind was like a Ferrari engine, racing at a thousand miles an hour, as every second seemed like an eternity for me. Once we did reach Pittsburgh, one of the gentlemen turned around and said to me, "'Only fifty miles to your uncle's farm. You must be so excited to see him.' "'I do not know my uncle,' I said. I've never met him in my entire life.' The men looked incredibly startled by my mind-blowing revelation. It had not occurred to them that I had no relationship with my uncle whatsoever, and I had caught them completely off guard. "'You've never met him,' said one of the men. "'But he's listed as your next of kin. Surely you should know him.' "'What's happened to my parents?' I asked them suddenly. "'I know something has happened. Are they dead? You wouldn't be asking me about my next of kin otherwise, would you?' I could not believe it. I'd actually said the words. They were just too terrible to articulate. "'Tell me,' I urged. "'Are they dead? I need to know. You have to tell me.' I think we should tell her, said the younger man. Very well, said the driver. I watched the older of the two men pulling the car to the side of the road and breaking almost too quickly for comfort. He sat there for a moment in very deep contemplation, stroking his grey moustache and looking at me thoughtfully through his kind blue eyes. Your parents are not dead, but they've been in a very serious car accident and they're both in very critical grave condition. It's a miracle that they're actually alive. Go back to New York at once, I demanded. I need to see them right now. It won't make any difference if you do, because if you go back, they're in a medically induced coma and they won't even know that you're there, so your presence will not be of any benefit. The tears were pouring down my face and I was sobbing uncontrollably. Are they going to die, I cried. They have a very good chance of pulling through, said the younger man, trying to reassure me. Just keep praying. Believe me, nothing beats the power of prayer. There is every chance that you could both make, they could both make a very full recovery, but they are going to need plenty of time to heal, and the best thing you can do for them is to stay at your uncle's until they become better and they fully recover. You really think that they might recover, I asked. There's every chance, said the older man. The main thing is to stay strong and to keep positive. Fast forward a couple of days, and I was now staying on my uncle's large meadow farm in Philadelphia that consisted of beautiful rolling virescent hills, vast areas of natural oak and maple forests, and a shimmering silver lake. I must say that after living the fast-paced lifestyle of a typical New Yorker, this serene, peaceful world for me was simply so breathtakingly serene and magically enchanting. Meeting my father's brother for the first time was exceedingly awkward for me. I knew that he and my father had not been on speaking terms for many long years now. It was very uncomfortable to suddenly be living under the same roof of my father's sworn enemy. Yet he was such a nice man and reminded me a lot of my father. They even looked remarkably alike. Both were about six foot tall, were slender built with dark hair, olive brown skin and sparkling blue eyes. My uncle lived all alone on his farm in an old manor house that was spacious and cosy and had no family to speak of, which was curious. I wondered why he had never married, and what made him want to live in such a huge, solitary wilderness all on his own. I'm afraid I'm quite busy during the day, attending to the affairs of the farm, he told me, but I'm sure there are things you can do on this farm to keep yourself busy and occupied during the day. I do have a lovely mare you can ride called Marigold. 
She has a gentle nature, and she's very, very attentive and kind. I also have a mountain bike you might enjoy. Thanks, I said. I'll be fine. To my surprise, I settled into country life like a duck to water, and I would get up early in the morning to collect the chicken eggs from the coops. I would then go and stroke the horses and brush their beautiful manes, and even talk to them. I really loved Marigold. She was a cinnamon-coloured mare with a coal-black tail and sumptuous mane. I would talk to her about my parents, and it was so therapeutic because I almost believed that she understood exactly what I was saying. I spoiled her rotten all the time with apples and carrots, and I certainly won her approval, and a solid, fr and a solid friendship between the two of us was very definitely formed. I rode her daily across the beautiful rolling green meadows, enjoying the cool breeze blowing lightly against my face, and appreciating the magnificent panoramic views of the open countryside, while I listened to the pretty bird song across the valley. One day when I was riding Marigold, we got close to the vast sylvan area on my uncle's land that consisted of very statuesque, majestic oak and maple trees that literally towered up in the skies like tall emerald giants. Suddenly I really got the feeling that someone was watching me, and it was so instinctive that I was almost certain my gut was spot on. Someone was definitely watching me, I thought. I surveyed the whole forest line to see if I could see who or what it was, but I couldn't see anything. I noticed that Marigold was a little petulant and on edge and seemed to be eager to move away. Her awkward reaction affirmed to me that something was distinctly off. I dismounted, leaving Marigold to graze in the meadow, as I entered the forest. I almost felt like I was being supernaturally drawn into the depths of this curious space by an unseen presence that was luring me in. It seemed to have such a powerful, galvanising hold over me, almost like the forest was beckoning me into its depths with outstretched branches that waved like powerful arms, gesturing me in to enter with an insatiable eagerness. Come, come, was the sound of the soft breeze blowing in my ears. It was so pretty in the woods, and the large oak trees provided a beautiful canopy, and light literally sprinkled itself through the branches, dappling the floors in soft shadows. The forest floor was covered in pretty ferns, grasses, shrubs, wildflowers and club mosses. It was so still and quiet in the woods, and I was surprised not to see any signs of life, and the bird song had seemingly dissipated. It was almost too quiet for comfort, I thought, making the forest take on a more menacing ambience. Then I saw it, and it was growing up some of the oak trees. It was an edible mushroom I had learnt about in school when I did a verbal talk on edible funguses a long time ago that I had presented in front of the entire class, and it had gone down very well. The fascinating yellow fungi was known as chicken of the woods, and I would have known it anywhere, and it was supposed to taste exactly like chicken. If it grew on oaks or maples, it was considered to be non-toxic. I suddenly felt incredibly excited and starting detaching some of this layered fungi off the trunk. I was just about to reach down for another fungi lying at the lower level of the bark close to the ground. As I did this, a large hairy shadowy form dived off the oak tree and landed on the ground, causing it to vibrate and shudder under its ample weight. Suddenly a monstrous hairy hand with fingers the size of sausages seized my hand violently pushing it away from the tree trunk as quickly as it could. Coiled up where I was about to get some yellow fungi was a yellow-brown rattlesnake that had suddenly become very aggressive towards me, with its long head rising into a striking position and its forked tongue flicking and ready to lash out in any second. I knew if I had not been saved by the quick intervention and heroism of this extraordinary creature that this serpent would have unleashed its deadly poison into my hand. Not that you would say that rattlesnakes kill you, but this would have been a very dangerous bite. I watched the strange creature, whatever on earth it was, lunging towards the perinous, perinous snake, grabbing it by the tail and ripping its head off in one swift move. It then threw the rest of the snake over its shoulder, like a long, fashionable snailskin, snakeskin scarf that most of New York's elite would love to wear. That, that is, of course once it is devoid of its innards. The hairy humanoid was like nothing I've ever seen in my life. It was covered from head to toe with silver-black hair, and was about six foot tall and five hundred pounds, and it had a very distinct ape-like humanoid appearance. The creature was what you would call ripped with ample muscular definition, huge shoulders, long arms, 
and very interesting cone-shaped head with a very sweet ape-like face and a very large flat nose, a prominent brow ridge and the most beautiful yellow-brown eyes that I've ever seen that twinkled with a humorous warmth. I just stood there in awe as I regarded this amazing animal with a curious interest because it was something that I had never imagined could exist in our reality. I knew I should be terrified of this thing because it had a powerful, majestic, lofty presence that demanded a fearful respect. But how could I be terrified of something that just saved my entire life? The creature had such a friendly countenance as were infinitely more curious about me than I was about him. He eyed me continuously with a curious fascination and I believed he liked me at once and the feeling was definitely reciprocated. It started to pull off some of the fungi of the tree for me and it pointed to the ground as if he was trying to elucidate to me and miming by making sure that I would understand that cobras could be on the forest floor. I laughed out loud because the creature was a natural comedian that you would pay good money to watch because he was effortlessly funny. I was about to cram a big piece of the chicken of the woods fungus into my mouth. The creature shook his head furiously and grabbed it out of my hand. He then took my hand in his and rubbed a corner of the fungi on a little area of my skin. And then he gave me a tiny nail-sized piece to try in my mouth. I was obedient to this creature's suggestions, as I imagined he knew a lot more about plants in the woods than I did. After a few minutes the creature checked my hand where he had rubbed the fungi, and then he nodded his head excitedly and handed me a large piece to taste. I realised suddenly that maybe some people were allergic to this fungus and he was checking me for sensitivity. I chewed, chewed it and it was very tasty indeed, but it would have been even more delectable if it was cooked and served with some melted butter and garlic. The creature then gathered me a selection of forest edibles to try, from dandelions, morals, spruce trips and wild spruce tips and wild garlic. It was like the forest had come alive with edibles I never knew you could actually eat. I was tasting everything that the creature was presenting to me. The hairy humanoid ape was chattering excitingly all the time and watching my reaction to everything I tasted. And every time I tasted something different, he looked like a proud chef waiting to hear you appraise his culinary prowess. prowess. Suddenly there was a shrill, horrified female scream coming from the woods, and I noticed a swift, thunderous movement in the bush. Then I saw her, a female hairy humanoid with small breasts. She was striding towards the hairy humanoid ape, and her tone was atribulous, like that of an angry mother who has just had about more than enough than she could take of her naughty youthling. She kept pointing to the tree, and I watched the creature reach for a branch and obediently slip up into the higher branches, with a flawless agility that reminded me of a monkey. He gave me one last look with his bright big brown eyes, and then in seconds he was up to the top of the tree canopy. I looked up and I could not see him there, but he sent down a little broken twig that flew down to the tree to me, affirming that he was indeed still up there. The mother looked awkward and uncomfortable in my presence, and I guessed that she simply hated being around human eyes and was quite simply out of her comfort zone. She regarded me suspiciously with her large brown eyes, with a look of, well, you've seen me now, so I guess I'm going to just have to deal with it. She then just nodded her head in my direction, and then within seconds she was gone on her long agile legs, and she glided seamlessly through the forest. I called up to the creature on the tree canopy, and he threw down a few more twigs. When I told my uncle that I'd nearly been bitten by a cobra, he went very quiet for a long time, as if mentioning my near miss with a cobra, had hit a rather raw nerve with him. I did not tell him that I had been rescued by an ape-like humanoid in case he thought I would lost my marbles. Then he said something very strange. You probably wonder why your father and I have not been on talking terms for a long time. I did wonder about that, I said, but I didn't want to ask. Well, it was all to do with the rattlesnake bite. Really? I asked in shock. What happened and, and what rattlesnake bite are you talking about? Well, I was married once, he said, to a lovely lady called Doris. One day your father and I were helping. Your father was helping me clear out one of my outhouses, and Doris insisted on helping out. She was carrying a cardboard box out with her hand holding the inside brim of the box. She told your father that something had bitten her, and he told her it was nothing to worry about, and it was more than likely a harmless spider or even a mosquito. Even after her, hand, even after her hands began to swell, 
He didn't appear to be at all worried about her. He said she was possibly slightly allergic to the spider, which was why her hands were swollen and blue. Oh, my word, I gasped. Your wife died because of my dad. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say. Well, your father did finally check the cardboard box, just in case there was a poisonous spider in there, and imagine his horror when he discovered that the box contained three rattlesnakes. He immediately rushed Doris to the hospital, but even after they administered the anti-venom, she just didn't make it. It was too late. If he had had more prompt, if he had been more prompt, she would have been fine. A rattlesnake bite is rarely fatal. So you lost your wife? You must have been broken, I said, looking at my uncle in horror. I cannot imagine how you must have felt. I was utterly devastated. Doris was my world, said my uncle, choking on his words and fighting back the moisture in his eyes. So you cut ties with my dad, I said. You blamed him for Doris's death. I'm afraid so, said my uncle. I did hold your father accountable for not checking Doris out after she was bitten. When you live in the country, you do need to investigate bites that cannot be explained. You cannot just assume that it was a harmless spider. And that's unfortunately what your dad did. It was a big mistake on his part. I don't blame you, I said, reaching out to touch my uncle's hands reassuringly. In your shoes, I would also have found it exceedingly difficult to forgive my father. I really do understand, you know. I should have forgiven him, though, said my uncle. He is lying there, now unconscious, in a hospital bed, fighting for his life, and I may never be able to make it right with him if he does not pull through. So you forgive him, I asked, looking at my uncle in surprise. I certainly do, said my uncle. You cannot live your life with regret and bitterness for so long. I've held such hatred towards your father, and what a waste of life that was, to hate in your heart so much after all these years. Having you here in my home has made me see that only too clearly, and I'm very disappointed my in myself for such mean behaviour. I have missed out on getting to know my very special niece because of unforgiveness in my heart. I'm sure mum and dad will be fine, I said. I'm sure they'll recover. I do feel it in my gut. And the news hasn't been bad. We keep getting positive reports from the hospital. Well, I hope you're right, said my uncle, because I have a lot of making up to do if that's the case. The next few weeks were spent, all my spare time, riding Marigold over the meadows and visiting my hairy humanoid friend, whom I decided to call Hugo. He would be sitting on the canopy of the old oak tree under his mother's strict instructions, always waiting for me to appear. I would hear him chatter excitedly when he heard me coming, and he always did. He would throw down some pieces of twigs just to let me know that he was actually there. If I looked up the tree, I was never able to see him, because he would seemingly appear invisible. So I do know how those creatures manage not to be seen, because they really are absolutely brilliant at hiding. Sometimes he would creep down the trunk of the tree, looking over his shoulder anxiously to check if his mother was coming. He was always worried about being reprimanded about her, by her, because she was quite a tough cookie. If he thought the coast was clear, we would spend some time on the forest floor collecting edible plants and playing hide-and-seek together. There was only one problem. I don't recommend playing hide-and-seek with a humanoid ape, because they can hide in plain sight and you'll never ever find them, as I've told you. Naturally, Hugo find my, found my inability to find him hilariously funny and very curious, but I was infinitely less amused by that. How did he manage to hide so flawlessly? That's something I'll never be able to get over. I found the companionship I had with this hairy humanoid to be one of the most authentic relationships I've ever known in my entire life. And I can tell you this, I loved him like a best friend. And all these years later, I consider him one of the best things that has ever happened to me in my entire life. He was funny, comical, and always so warm. And all these years later, I miss him terribly. Fast forward six weeks, and both my parents had miraculously pulled through, and they made a long, slow, but miraculous recovery. My mother had no memory of her accident, but she does remember a dream when she walked into my classroom during a maths lesson, and she tried to tell me not to worry and that she would be absolutely fine. I then told her that I had physically felt her presence and smelt her Chanel, Chanel number no. 5. To this day my mother wonders if she had some kind of outer body experience because she rarely believes she came to visit me in that classroom.
my father and uncle, you'll be glad to know, reconciled, and it was such an emotional, beautiful reunion that brought tears to my eyes. As you can imagine, what possibly was one of the most harrowing, terrifying times in my entire life turned out to be the most memorable and precious. I discovered many long years later that Hugo was in fact a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, Yeti or Hairy Man, and I never saw him again after he left my uncle's farm. I'm sure he relocated, because those creatures are like nomads, and they travel with the food sources available to them, so if there's food in another place, they'll invariably go there. I always remember him with so much love, and when I go hiking in areas of remote wilderness with my husband and my two children, I'm always hoping in my heart that I'll have an encounter with Hugo. I know that we would recognise each other, even after all these years, and I'm still searching for him and hoping all these years later. Well, I just want to say that that is the most fantastic story. Can you imagine being rescued from a rattlesnake by a Bigfoot just because you're looking for some fungi in the forest? It's just fantastic. Until next time, goodbye and good night.